Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, abandoning your tea and coming to join. Uh, what I thought I would do this morning is talk to you about social physics and the big data society, as you just said. Social physics is a phrase that's almost two centuries old. Uh, about the time that uh, physics was coming into being, it used to be natural science, uh, and chemistry was being born, which used to be alchemy, uh, there rose this idea that perhaps you could do the same thing with government, that you could have a real science of government where you would put out policies and they would just work, and they would work the right way. Um, and that uh, idea, of course, was abandoned relatively quickly because people are a lot more complicated than physics. Uh, but the dream has maintained over the time, and today we have more big data than ever before, uh, for good or for, or for evil, and we have very fancy computer learning techniques and mathematics techniques, so we can really begin to understand how uh, big data and society work together or fail to work together, and that's why I have the title is that the journey towards a big data society uh, is going to have to involve a lot of research and contemplation about human nature and what we actually want in terms of privacy and self-determination and how government should work. Uh, I say the big data society because that's where we're headed whether we like it or not. The fact that we have cell phones that need to know where they are in order to be able to work, or credit cards that help us pay things, or sensors that help the traffic uh, work well on our roads, uh, now wearable devices that have medical things, are all things that we've proven we will not give up. Uh, and they all promise to have real benefits to the average person to give us personalized health care and better cities and so on and so forth. And so whether we like it or not, we're headed towards a big data society. And I think that it behooves us to try and understand what big data and human nature have to do with each other and how we can best use this big data to serve uh, human purposes. So if we go to the next slide, it says the Cyborg Collective. Um, I want to start with a journey that I began some 20 years ago, um, and that is shown here. At that time, the World Wide Web was just beginning. It was a sort of a dream still. Um, uh, it had just occurred to people that there would be computers everywhere, and it seemed to me that the computers would be small enough that they could be worn on the body, and they would go with you everywhere, and that communication would be wireless. Remember, there was no Wi-Fi or, or 4G or, or cell phones, for that matter, at this time. And so I helped create a race of cyborgs, uh, which are 20 students uh, at MIT who wore computers, wore sensors, had head-up displays that, uh, you know, shot little lasers into their eyes so they could read text and see images as they walked around. And, uh, and we tried to imagine what the future would be like. And we learned many things. Um, one of the first things we learned is nobody in their right mind would wear things like this. Uh, so I started a project with a fashion school in Paris, which you can see in the next slide, the one that says Pentland Project. Uh, and working together with designers uh, in Paris, we imagined what the future would be like as computers continued to shrink and wireless continued to grow. And you can see that the ideas that they came up with look a lot like today. There's a, a tablet that looks a lot like an iPhone 6, and there's a, a, a head-mounted display that looks a lot like Google Glass. And in fact, one of the students in my group there went on to be the technical lead for, for Google Glass. And many of the innovations that we take for granted today, because we all rock around with cell phones and and things like that, uh, came from, from that research 20 years ago. But one of the things we didn't expect when we did this was what sort of view of humanity we would get by having sensors on the human body 
24-7 as people went about their daily life. Because this was the first time that you'd ever had devices that knew where they were, could listen and hear if people were talking or not, had accelerometers to know how you moved, and so on and so forth. So a little like humans observe apes or ants and come up with a, a view of the ant society or the ape society that has this sort of almost godlike uh, vantage point, having sensors on people gave us a, a, a third-person view of humanity that had never been possible before. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the idea here is, is that what we would observe by looking at these sensors is really not so much things that have to do with free will, but they have to do with the commonalities among us. Uh, because the learning techniques, the mathematical techniques, are, are only good at predicting the things that are frequent and that are highly correlated. And so what we were beginning to observe were the patterns of culture and the patterns of biology, of human uh, biology, as we went about our lives. And, and one of the things that we became apparent very quickly is that while we like to think of ourselves as cognitive and fully in control of ourselves and making decisions based on the values of those particular decisions, that's very far from the truth. In fact, human life is very patterned, very driven by circumstance, and those same sort of patterns can be found in apes and even bees and other social species. And I want to give you a, a couple of uh, senses of what it is that you can see when you have this sort of data. Um, and then from that, I want to go to the sorts of things that could be used for in government particularly. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the one that says habits versus novelty, you'll see a picture of a brain with the center part highlighted. And this is work that um, is drawn from the neuroanatomy of, of humans and the behavior of humans. And what it says is that many of our oldest parts of our brain are the ones that are in charge of our day-to-day -day life. They're the ones that are in charge of habits. And that the newer parts of our brain, the cortex and so forth, are really much more involved in novelty and new things that we do. But by looking at the data, we can understand that perhaps 90 or 95 percent of everything that we do as we go through our life is habitual. And only a small percentage is novel. And so we can begin separating out the things that we share with each other, the things that are almost like a heartbeat, but a, but a cultural heartbeat or a, uh, an intelligence heartbeat, as opposed to uh, the things which are the fanciful thoughts that go through their head that are each individual to ourselves. So when you begin looking at the habitual behavior of humans, you discover many sort of interesting things. So if you could go to the next slide that says an innovation uh, and says Ginger I.O. prominently there, this is one of the things that I think is most interesting uh, about sort of small scale data. So we had an experiment which is like a medical experiment. So people were paid and they opted in and they had informed consent. And we looked at uh, all of the people in a community for a whole period of a year. And we did something sort of nasty to them, which is uh, at, when they got up in the morning, they could not use their cell phone unless they answered five questions for us. Uh, and people were, of course, irritated by this, but they had opted in and we were, being, we were paying them for this. Um, so they answered the questions. And some of the questions we asked had to do with symptoms of flu, symptoms of stress, symptoms of depression. And what we discovered was that you could see when someone was getting sick, you could see when they were getting depressed, you could see when they were getting stressed out by how their habits changed. So instead of getting up at the normal time and calling the normal people, they would get up at a different time, they would go to bed early, they would call different people at different times. And in fact, the, the signature of how people got depressed, the signature of how they got stressed, the signature of how they got sick was different. 
And what that meant is you could have something that's like the check engine light in your car uh, that just monitored your behavior and raised its hand, put up that red light when it saw that you were, your habits were degrading, you were decompensating, you were getting sick. Now, this is not anything that the people had to do. They just used their phones in the normal way. Uh, but their habits had changed, and, and the phone and a little algorithm in there could determine that. Um, not perfectly, only maybe 80% accuracy. But you'll see the quote at the top of this slide that says, this is an innovation that will save our health system. And that's by the chief technical officer of the United States. And so it's worth tending a second to understand that. So this is now a spinoff company. Um, its biggest investor is a large healthcare system, a vertically integrated healthcare system called Kaiser Permanente. And what they want it for is the following. They have millions of customers, millions of people whose health they maintain. Uh, and at any one moment, they know that thousands of them are getting seriously ill. But they don't know which ones. They, in fact, they'll only know about these people perhaps a month or two months later when they're extremely sick and very hard to cure. So what they would like to know is they would like to know when people are getting sick. And when they see that, they'll give them a telephone call and say, how are you feeling? And if you're not feeling well, come into the hospital and get looked at. Talk to your doctor. Um, they do this currently just with people that have serious problems like congestive heart failure, uh, advanced diabetes, and so forth. But by getting to people early, you can cure diseases much more reliably and much cheaper. And that's what the CTO of the United States meant, is that you can potentially shave the healthcare system cost by an order of magnitude while delivering much better care, proactive health care, as opposed to the reactive care that we have today. So that's one of the things that this sort of data, while it's very scary on one end, has a real promise on the other end. If we go to the next slide, the one that says Pulse of the City, this is just a diagram of uh, people moving around in San Francisco. So this is public data. Um, anonymized, so you couldn't tell who they were. But one of the things you notice is that there's all these dots that are color-coded. And what it turns out is, is that if you cluster the paths of people moving around, anonymous people, you find that there are different subsets of people in San Francisco, people that uh, go to different sorts of places. There's the people that like rock and roll and the people that like classical music and, and so on and so forth. It's just like the demographic we data, which says, oh, in this neighborhood, there's, you know, people are average age 50 and make so much money and so forth. So here you're stratifying people not by where they live, but by patterns of behavior. And it turns out that health things, health uh, diseases, chronic diseases, go along with, with these patterns of behavior. So one group, for instance, in this, uh, for no particular reason, we don't know why, but they're much more susceptible to uh, diabetes than others. So if you want to save the, the huge cost of diabetes, this is very useful knowledge, is, is that certain sorts of behavior give rise to diabetes, and if you're going to do a proactive health uh, intervention, these are the locations where you ought to look for people that are, are good people to, to change the behavior of. Other people, of course, have other sorts of diseases. And again, what this is doing is this is changing the public health knowledge about the city using anonymous data. And then you go in and you find out what these clusters of people are, are doing by talking to them individually. So it's beginning to get the information that you need to design a better healthcare system. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So if we go to the next slide, and the one that says lack of diversity predicts crime. Um, I helped O2, the carrier in the UK, um, release a lot of their data uh, along with crime data. So the data that they released was not individual data at all. This is data about cell tower use. And the data was things like, well, at this cell tower, 
there are 25% of the people are from this town and 10% are from this other town and so forth. And they would give this sort of reading every couple hours so that you could look at the mixing between communities in the UK. And it turns out that communities that had very little mixing, low diversity, were communities that had much higher crime. Very good way of predicting crime ratio uh, values. And in fact, if you saw things that were moving towards less diversity, in other words, the population mixing was changing so that the old people no longer showed up in a square, people from the other pound never came, <coughs> that was a great predictor of that the crime uh, was going to go up in the area. So this is not prediction of individual people at all. There's no individual data in it at all. It's a prediction about location. And it's showing that lack of diversity of people coming to a location is correlated with crime, and particularly change in diversity is a, a predictor of crime. So if we go to the next slide, we'll continue this theme a little more. So the graph that's on your left-hand side um, shows data about socioeconomic index. So this is from the UK. Um, every dot there is one neighborhood or council. And the dot, the socioeconomic index is, a, is the sum of infant mortality, crime, GDP, life expectancy. And along the bottom is the communications pattern of that community. So again, anonymous, aggregate, and it's basically does the community call a lot within itself or does the community talk to the rest of the society very much? And it adds those two factors together and it turns out you can predict the number of babies dying, the crime rate, the GDP very accurately from that. This, the way to think about this is that ghettos are bad places. Places with a great deal of diversity and interaction with the rest of society are almost always very good places. We've also done this in the Cote d'Ivoire, so a Western African country. This time it's not call patterns, it's mobility, again from cell phones, but again also no individual data, just how many people in this location are from other towns. And it turns out that you can do a very accurate job of mapping poverty in a uh, uh, country where the government can't go to most of the country because they had a recent civil war. So you can begin to see into the patterns of behavior, these habits that people have, and begin to know a lot about how the communities are doing in a way that's never been possible before, except if you would hire a huge number of people to go and survey everybody, which is something that, for instance, in the Cote d'Ivoire, they haven't been able to afford to do this for more than 30 years. Now they can do it cheaply for uh, not very many dollars at all. Similarly, uh, if you go to the next slide, the one that says D for D at the top, um, working with Orange, the carrier and, uh, that operates both in Europe and in uh, Francophone Africa, uh, we've done a couple of countries where along with the UN and the World Economic Forum and uh, the GSMA and other partners, uh, we assembled a model of what a big data society might look like. It's the cell phone data, the financial data, the census data, the health data, all in one spot and all for the full country. And asked academics all around the world, what could we do with it? And one of the first things is, is that for this sort of data, where it isn't anything that's personal data, you can do still do a huge amount about uh, helping the society. So no one was able to relate any of this data to individuals, so there's no privacy concern per se. But they were able to do things like ask, where do the people live who work in this location? Where do the people who live here tend to work? And that let them do things like optimize the bus system, saving over 10% of the cost of the bus system, optimize the public health system, improving its efficiency by almost 20%. So these are some of the things that are on the plus side of big data. Right? And if you go to the next slide, 
you'll see uh, something that says the UN data revolution. So this has been noticed by the UN and many sort of health and, and aid organizations. And the Secretary General calls this the, the data resolution. Um, the idea here is, or the realization is, is that in most parts of the world, um, we don't know what's happening. Uh, we don't know where the babies are dying. We don't know where infectious diseases are spreading. We don't know where there's ethnic violence because there's no data. Um, so while it may not be, it may be a scary thing for Christchurch or for New York or for Boston, um, in most parts of the world, it, it makes individuals visible in the first time. And that's why it's called a world that counts. Today, most people in the world simply are invisible. And of course, their problems and their needs are not serviced as a consequence. And the UN has a, a practical view on this, which is that over the last 15 years, they've had the Millennium Development Goals uh, started in 2000 and uh, ending this year. And these were uh, ambitious goals to have poverty, to reduce infant mortality, and so on and so forth. And what they noticed was that uh, goals that were easy to measure were achieved. Goals that were not measured did not get achieved. And so what they're trying to do now as they come to the next 15-year period leading to 2030 uh, is a new set of goals called the Sustainable Development Goals, which are like the Millennium Development Goal, but including also things about uh, ecology and sustainability. And as part of those goals, they've determined that they will actually measure things, the statistics, the behavior uh, to, of each of these goals. So they will measure infant mortality, ethnic violence, in discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. And they have charged the national statistical offices of every country in the world uh, to begin measuring these things in a unifying way so that we can begin comparing one country with another. And that's an amazing transformation in terms of the transparency of government and the accountability. Uh, if this actually comes to pass, what you'll be able to do is say, well, in this country, they're not reducing infant mortality as fast as that is in their neighbor. And that will embarrass the Minister of Health. And perhaps they'll actually try a little harder to reduce infant mortality. So if you haven't heard of this or seen it, I would urge you to search for it on the web. Just search for Data Revolution. You'll find a website called that, UN Data Revolution, or A World That Counts, and read it. And it shows the, the tension between privacy, and what an authoritarian government might do with this data, and the desperate need for four or five billion people in the world to have enough data that their voices and their plight is heard. So I wanted to start with this because I think people get too, con too focused on what big data might mean in their particular life and what companies might do to convince you to buy more coffee or something like that. Uh, there's really a much bigger question here, which is, you know, the health prosperity of the entire planet is facing great challenges. And without data, uh, we don't have any idea how we'd address that. And with data, we do have the idea that there is a possible path forward. Um, but let's return to the practicalities of how we might go about this, because clearly privacy, identity, freedom are core issues. So if we go to the, the next slide that's unique in the shopping mall, this is a paper um, that we produced for Science, which is the leading scientific journal in the world, uh, just this year. And what it shows is that all the ways of anonymizing data are almost always or generically, something that can be attacked, and you can re-identify things. So a lot of the systems that we have in the world for using big data uh, are vulnerable in ways that we didn't expect. And this is already having, uh, I think, a quite beneficial uh, effect. So for instance, 
you all know about the Snowden affair and the National Security Agency in the United States. Uh, just last week, uh, the National Security Agency collection of bulk data was outlawed in court, um, and the primary citation was this paper. So the logic was is that they were arguing, the NSA was arguing, well, this is all anonymous, we don't look at the identifiers, and what this paper shows is, even with that, you're not safe. And so the court decided that what they were doing was indeed not something that could be allowed. Uh, so I feel like we did something good there. Um, what that means is shown in the next slide, which is, is that one needs to think about several different categories of data now. Um, and this anonymous data that people talk about is now a deeply suspect thing. So there's personal data, which is things that relate to individuals. And in general, the attitude that you see in regulators around the world is that can only be used with informed consent. So the individual whose data, who the data is about, has to be informed about it, has to understand it and its ramifications, and has to consent or not consent. These are the rights of ownership. Now, in Europe, uh, informed consent is a somewhat controversial thing because they don't actually have many places where they use informed consent. In the United States, in contrast, informed consent is quite common, not only in research and medical things, but also in financial industry. Um, and while things are complicated, it turns out that you can make uh, disclosures uh, that are adequate to get people to understand what's going on. And typically, that sort of informed consent uh, is something that requires intermediaries. It requires advocates. Um, so people that you know, work on having uh, standard ways of handling sensitive data, just like there are standard ways of handling money. Um, so I don't want to go too much into that, uh, but that might be a useful sort of question. This is how can people understand their data? Um, and then the other type of data that is uh, useful uh, is not the anonymized data, but aggregate data. So this is data where uh, it's like census data. So you've taken over a period of space and time you've said an average number of, say, people are there or people from a particular place. But because it's aggregate and the number of people involved in that is large, you can't relate that to any one person. And what the previous slide, the unique slide, showed was that you have to maintain each statistic like that independently. You can't say, oh, you know, this cell in the uh, uh, census relates to this other cell. So you have to have them uh, have a certain uh, independence. Um, that's a sort of technical thing. But, but this sort of data is actually appears to be quite safe to use. We've used it for hundreds of years in the census. We use it for medical uh, science, for many other things. And most of the examples that I just showed you are either aggregate data or things like in the, the, the health application, things that people have opted in on the advice of their doctor. So there's a, a view that I have and I think is broadly developing that we need to really focus mostly on um, informed consent, letting people know what the data is being used for, and uh, aggregate data, which is much safer. And the aggregate data, uh, is something that uh, companies have to use to maintain their systems. So it's a naturally generated thing. Uh, for instance, cell phones, uh, companies have generated aggregate data and used it to maintain uh, logistics chains, uh, financial systems, communication systems for a century or more uh, without any incidents that, that I'm aware of, certainly. Um, so what I've tried to tell you, first of all, is, is that we're coming to a big data world, whether we like it or not. There are upsides to this in terms of having more effective, transparent, and accountable data. The UN is 
recognize that and moving towards it, as are many, many countries, including, I think, New Zealand. Um, but it involves thinking through what sorts of data are safe and what things aren't and how you can use them. Uh, and I think that's what this conference is doing now. If we go to the next slide where it says the New Deal on Data, this is a suggestion uh, that I made now six years ago when uh, I realized how powerful this data was. We were, as research, using mobile phone data, some of the very first mobile phones, um, and um, realized that they had both the good aspect and the dangerous aspect. And I proposed to the World Economic Forum um, essentially a scheme whereby people would be more involved in their data, where they would have the rights of ownership to possess, control, and dispose. It's not the same as actual ownership. That's much trickier to, to think about. Uh, but essentially that they would be able to know what's happening with their data. They'd have to give consent to it. You can think of this as a, a, a scheme in which people give companies a license to use their data, but they can retract that license, and then the data has to go away. Um, and a scheme in which such licenses and the transfer of data can be audited easily. Now, this is not very different than what we do with money today. You know, money is just ones and zeros now. It's all digital. You give it to the bank. The bank has standard ways of dealing with things. Um, you can have confidence in it because you know it's standard and you know that it's audited. Uh, you give the money to the bank. When you don't like what the bank is doing, you take it back. Uh, you can imagine the same type of thing, same types of systems, and same type of informed consent, and same type of auditing for personal data. That uh, this suggestion that I made was debated uh, for several years at Davos, World Economic Forum, uh, by groups that included the Justice Missioner of the EU, the head of the U.S. Federal Trade Unit uh, Commission, uh, very senior people from China and, and elsewhere. And in the end, there was fair agreement among people with some variations that this was really the right way to do things. Uh, and the core of this is, is that we currently live in a, a, an era where we have rights of our own bodies. We've gone from the Magna Carta to more or less democratic systems. But we haven't done the same thing in the digital uh, domain. We all have digital identities, uh, but we don't own our digital identities. And we, in fact, don't even know often what our digital identities are. They're owned by companies and by the government. Uh, so this is like the Middle Ages, where you didn't actually own the rights to yourself. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is give people more involvement in the system let them drive what are the good uses, what are the bad uses through informed consent um, to reach a place where we have what you would call digital democracy. Now, this sounds a little pie in the sky, a little uh, idealistic, but you can actually uh, uh, make good motion towards this in the EU. They have the uh, data protection acts that are being uh, uh, put into place, and in the US, you have the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. We can talk more about that if you're interested. Those things will apply first to regulated industries, but eventually to all industries, including things like the Facebooks and Googles of the world. Um, in the meantime, when you talk about this notion of sort of digital democracy and um, people having rights to it, um, you have to know what data you have, and you have to be able to have some control over it. And so there are practical things that we've done. Like for instance, in my lab, we've created uh, something called the Open Personal Data Store, which has uh, a, a number of things that have been the result of very large uh, uh, discussions and research. So it's a data store where uh, people that you want to share data with can come and ask for uh, answers about your data. So are you in this town? Are you this age? Things like that. Uh, but you get to control what's released and what's not released. Um, and there's a lot of reasons to believe that this is something that will, some version of this will eventually be things that are used by telcos, by uh, hospitals, uh, by banks.
In fact, you see progress towards this. In the United States, um, the idea that people control their medical records is already prevalent. They don't have a way, though, to receive their medical records and to control where they go. And having a personal data store gives them a concrete method of doing that. Um, the same thing is being considered by telcos around the world uh, as a way of allowing people uh, uh, being able to use the valuable data that they hold but are unable to use uh, because they don't have informed consent from their customers. Such a, a PDS has to have several components to it, um, one of which is a, a, a strong identity mechanism. And in the United States, um, the military developed such a thing uh, based on some open standards called Open ID Connect. And the National Strategy for Trusted Identity uh, has more or less endorsed that as a standard. And you see telcos around the world beginning um, to adopt this standard as what they call Mobile Connect. So it, it's a uh, improved variant of um, uh, ID Connect, uh, uh, the, the original sort of some of the original uh, identity mechanisms. Uh, it's an open source thing. We maintain it at MIT, um, uh, along with other people maintaining copies of it, and uh, you're beginning to see this spread everywhere. So that combined with some of the new multi-factor authentication can produce a very secure uh, type of, of identity mechanism. Um, it's a little bit similar to the, you know, the, the logon that you do with Facebook or with uh, Twitter, but this is something that you would control and would have much higher levels of, of security uh, associated with it. So that's you know, where we see identity simple in the simple sense of identity going if we go to the next slide um, safe answers there's a number of things that people want to see as technical parts of a system like this one we call safe answers which is uh, the whole idea of sharing data is sort of a broken idea uh, as part of the digital slavery versus digital democracy uh, you should have a situation where you only need to answer the minimum amount needed to obtain the service that you want. So if you want um, you know, to be connected on your cell phone, you should just be able to say, you know, here I am to a very large area to the cell tower, and that's all that they should know about you because that's all they need to know except for the payment mechanism. Uh, or other sorts of services you might want should not be asking for all your contact list or all your location or things like that, they should be asking for very specific things. So this open personal data store includes this idea of that. It also interestingly has um, some analogies in some of the safest networks in the world. So for instance, the, the safest network in the world is, may well be the, um, the SWIFT network, which is used for interbank transfers of money. So all the banks in the world transfer money between themselves using the SWIFT network. And the SWIFT network, of course, does not share the balances of accounts or transactions uh, that people may do, just the minimum amount of data needed to move the money from A to B. Uh, and that's sort of what Safe Answers is about, is mimicking a minimality in sharing of data. If you go to the next slide, the other thing that the SWIFT network has is a, a legal architecture. So uh, in the SWIFT network, if I send you a message saying I'd like to transfer some data to you, it's a very fixed format thing. And the sending of that message is the offer for a contract. Uh, if they reply yes to that, they have to reply it in a very fixed format. And that constitutes a signed peer-to-peer -peer contract. Uh, so what happens then is, is that the digital sharing of this minimal information is combined with legal restrictions on what it does, who can do what with it, what happens if there's a breach of the data, and in fact, the mediation of that. And it's interesting to note that you don't need additional regulation to do this. The SWIFT network runs on contract law, which is 
interoperable pretty much everywhere. So we can begin moving towards a, a world where people control their data a lot more using only contract law, but you need to have the technical means, the computer network means, in parallel with the uh, legal means and have those two synchronous and reinforcing. So two more things I want to mention. Uh, one is uh, on the next slide, NSA failures. Um, so this is a surprising fact from the Snowden affairs. After the Snowden uh, revelations were made, the head of the NSA said the failure originated from two practices. The first was putting all the information in one spot. So this is the sort of uh, gut response of organizations for all this data. They put everything in one big pile. Uh, and what that does is that pro provides a place for attackers to attack. And the asymmetry of attack is such that whenever you create a big honeypot like that, people are going to win and take it all. So well, organizations are beginning to understand what the NSA found out which is they should keep data, personal data, sensitive data, distributed. And as with a personal data store, distributing it down to the level of the, the people that are, the data is about is perhaps the safest way to do it. But this idea of having a distributed information uh, store where you can audit more carefully how the data is shared and used is core to security as well as privacy. So there's a beginning realization that security and privacy are really the same thing. Privacy is security for individuals, but the same architecture, the same legal frameworks are the basis of the next generation of security. And I think this is gonna be one of the main realizations that drives us towards a, a, a better future with respect to this data. Uh, the next to last slide says personal data labs, and I think this is an important concept. Currently, when we think about these things, we like to debate them without any facts uh, or just, you know, facts that, you know, we heard from somebody else. We need to be much more experimental about this. This is area where we, we are breaking new territory. And what I've been doing is setting up uh, experiments around the world where we try some of these concepts. So for instance, this one is from an experiment in Treto in Italy, where we put people in charge of their data through these personal data stores and asked, did it result in a better life experience for these people? Did they share more so that their life was better? Was it safer for them? Where they felt comfortable that they didn't have people spying on them? Was it a, an improvement from the current situation? The fundamental idea is to change the risk-reward ratio for sharing so that you get more sharing in society where you can get those public goods, but at the same time reduce the risk for the individuals so that they're more comfortable and safer. And I'm happy to report that in Trento things went well and we were able to actually improve the risk-reward ratio. But the broader point is that every society, every government should be experimenting with these things get public input into what are actually very complicated situations. Debating them in abstract does very little good beyond the sort of maybe first debate. Uh, you need to actually try things, reflect on what happened, improve them, and try again. So I'm a strong advocate of living labs, and uh, we've helped set up labs like that around the world. We'd be happy to work with you to, to do that. Uh, and the final slide is uh, the uh, requisite uh, advertisement, I guess. So I've written a book about this called Social Physics. Um, if you're interested in more detail, it's only $12 on Amazon. Uh, take a look. Uh, it goes into many of these things in a great more detail. So thank you. Uh, and I guess we have time for one or two questions. <clears throat>